Here we go. This is a statue of a Bigfoot Sasquatch type carved in Willow Creek, California. This gentleman's about 5'7". I'm 5'11". You can figure that if that thing was here, it'd be, his head would be up about right here. Okay. There are four kinds of hominoids. Four kinds. We know of two in the West primarily. Sasquatch Bigfoot, this kind. Abominable snowman, Yeti, and then there are two other kinds that are dominant in other parts of the world that we don't know very much about, the Almas and the Agagwes. Okay, now we're going to go over them. They're pretty much the same except for size. All right, the Bigfoot Sasquatch kind, as you see, 7 to 10 feet tall, 700 to 1,000 pounds on average. The giants, the big ones, the ones you hear the most about. The abominable snowman yeti, man-sized, 5 to 7 feet tall, 300 to 600 pounds, lives exclusively in the Himalayan ranges as far as we know. Taken together, those five ranges are as big as the United States, plenty of room to roam, but they are not on all continents. The Bigfoot Sasquatch kind is. The third kind, almas, the almas. They are found primarily in the mountains of southern Russia and western China, the Pamirs and the Caucasus, and the Altais and the Tian Shans. But they are also elsewhere in the world, including in the United States. Man-sized again, seven to five, uh, excuse me, five to seven feet tall, 300 to 600 pounds. Fourth kind, the Agagwes, about four feet tall, weigh about 200 pounds. The pygmies are the group. All right? Now, you might remember, ironically, there were four Australopithecines, four early homos, and what a surprise, there are four types, basic types of, of hominoids. Interesting, isn't it? Now, what they are is this. The, the Bigfoot Sasquatch kind live in what is called lower montane forests. Now, in mountainous terrain that are covered by trees, and if you've done any flying in the Pacific Northwest, you know what I'm talking about, the lower trees are called lower montane. As you go up, you get into upper montane. The Bigfoot Sasquatch lives in the lower montane. The abominable snowman lives in the upper montane uh, forests of the Himalayas. You get the idea, abominable snowman, he lives up in the snow. Nobody lives in the snow. There's nothing to eat there. They live in the upper valleys, and you see them occasionally as they cross from one valley to the other by going over a mountain, uh, uh, the snow part of it. Okay. Now, the Almas also live in the lower montanes, but they're more flexible. They also seem to be the smartest, and this is not to say they're anything like us. They're just very smart animals. The Almas are. I think they're going to prove out to be living Neanderthals. The evidence is strong that the Almas are living Neanderthals. Okay? The Agagwes, the fourth kind, the pygmy kind, live in the jungles of the world. That jungle band that goes through South America, Central Africa, and Indonesia that area. They, of the four, have reddish, russet-colored hair, like orangutans, which also live exclusively in jungles around the world. The others have dark browns and blacks, their body hair, covered with hair. Whenever anyone sees them, their characteristics are described consistently the same. Wherever in the world, whatever kind we're looking at, when the person sees it, and frequently this is some very, very isolated na native who doesn't even know that the rest of the world is out there, much less that these things are seen on other continents. And when they describe them, they always describe them the same way. They say, no forehead, huge brow ridges, big round deep set eyes, big flat nose, although this one isn't so big, but big flat nose up against their face, mouth sticking off their face, 
no chin, head tucked down into their torso, very long arms dangling around their knees, very thick, muscular, robust bodies, and covered with hair from head to toe. Now, take away the hair, and what did I just describe to you to a T? The prehumans. Am I right? You saw, the, you saw the skeletons. You saw the bones. The prehumans. What does this lead us to believe? The prehumans are the hominoids. The hominoids are the prehumans. The prehumans are the prehominoids. It's their ancestors, not ours. It's clear to anybody that will look at the evidence. The so-called prehumans are, in fact, prehominoids. Now, it's easy for me to stand up here and say this. What's the proof? Well, let's start right here with their feet. They leave tracks. All around the world, they leave tracks. We have upwards of 10,000 or more photographed, plaster-casted, or both. No question about it. And guess what? They're all fakes. All of them, every one of them is a fake. Problem being, it's not that they are really, in fact, fakes. They just can't be real. They can't be real because not only is Darwin a blowed up peck of wood, all of his followers are. And they don't want to be that. So these cannot be real, even though they are. Now, is, is it possible that they could all be fakes? All these tracks could be fakes? Could they fool everybody? No. Why? Because we know a lot about it. Let's take a look. There's a science called ichnology. And what, this, what an ichnologist does is he studies the tracks left in fossils by creatures going millions of years back. Show them a fossil, they can look at a print or a track or anything, they can tell you what made it. There's a whole science to it. If you go back into prehistory, all of our primitive tribes, the one thing, the one thing you had to pass on to your children was how to read the tracks in the area and know what they were so that they could feed their family out of the environment and so they could keep from feeding some wild animal's family. Very important. If you took everything we knew about, remember Tonto and those Indians, boy, they could just smell a track and tell you 20 things about what made it. We know about tracks. And this is two of the basic things we know. That when any living fleshy foot, like a human foot or a hominoid foot or even a camel pad, it doesn't matter, makes a track, puts a track down. The subtle interaction of bones in the foot, in our case it's 26 bones, 33 joints, dozens of muscles, ligaments, and tendons, makes a very subtle movement and, and lays it down in a very specific way from the midline out. And so it leaves a distinctive print with little lines in here called compression lines. Next slide. When you do it with a fake foot, you, can't, you don't get that, that subtlety of movement because there's no sequential parts to a, a fake foot. If, you, if you're missing a foot and you need a prosthesis, you're going to get just a dull, stiff foot. We cannot duplicate anything even close to it, even, anything even close to a real foot. So whether this is plaster or rubber or plastic or wood, it doesn't matter if you're making a fake foot, it's going to be of a piece, and so when you put it down into the medium, you have to stamp it or press it as a whole, and in doing so, you get a very distinctive look to that, and it's a little ridge here with cracks on the top and the outside, called, that's an impact ridge. So we have compression lines and impact ridges. Now, I can give this little lesson to a class of first graders, lay down a bunch of tracks here, real and fake, give them a magnifying glass, and they will not miss one. They will not miss one. Now, forest rangers that make their living out telling you, you know, bear, elk, zebra, what, it doesn't matter. Whatever it is, they can tell you what it is. And no anthropologist will question their expertise. But if they see a hominoid track and they say, oh, boy, that looks real to me too, the anthropologist say, well, you don't know what you're talking about there. You don't know what you're talking about there. That one's fake. You're wrong there. See how absurd it is? And for the most part, you believe it because you don't expect them to lie to you. You don't expect them to have an agenda that they're maintaining. But they do and they do, and keep it in mind. OK, next slide. All right, this is the way a human foot works, looks and works. This is, of course, a, a, a good foot, not a flat foot. This is a typical human foot with an arch. 
When we come down on our heel, we have to swing our momentum around the arch, then cut it over into the ball, which will regenerate some of the lost momentum, and then we come out thrusting off of our big toe. That's how we walk. Our smaller toes pull up and act as balancers. If you notice your feet tonight when you walk around, notice how that works. Your big toe will go down, your other toes, toes will pull up, and it will leave in making a medium, an undisturbed ridge of medium here, in making a track rather, an undisturbed ridge of medium right here, but this of course will be squashed. Very distinctive print, no question about it. Now guess what? We walk badly, badly. When you do time and motion studies of us walking, we're, we're keeling around as we're swinging our momentum through our feet. We're locking our knees. We're basically throwing ourselves through our hips. Whoever do, that's why our joints wear out as we age. Our knees and our hips, we're using them badly. We walk badly. Whoever designed us needed to go back to the drawing board a couple of times more. They got lazy. It was a mistake. Okay. With that in mind, next slide. Let's take a look at a hominoid track, typical hominoid track. This is Bigfoot, 16 inches long, but taken in that really nice powdery dirt you get at the end of a hot summer, so it's a very clear, distinct print. Notice, if you will, the differences. We have a midline about right here, ankle shifted very far forward, heel extended back here and very much widened, forefoot shortened very much and widened, all five toes looking about the same shape, ironically, square, and all five toes acting as balancers because you have medium all the way through here. So you're getting the forefoot thrust coming out completely of the ball area, which is dented in, and it's like a two-part motion, sort of. So they have a completely different foot. It's a completely redesigned foot. Why? Completely redesigned creature. Much bulkier, much heavier, much denser, much more robust. So you need a different kind of foot. No arch is going to support that kind of weight, so you have no arch. Now the funny thing about most real, quote, fake tracks is that the local yokels who make them make big human footprints and go out stamping those around. So you know, immediately, they don't even have sense enough to know you've got to do it you know, make a completely different foot. But the main thing to notice here is Remember, in our motion, we walk here, we go here, we do this, we do this, and we're very awkward. Look at the line of thrust here. Straight shot. What does this tell us? He walks right. He does it better than us. He does it the way it's supposed to be done, he or she. Does it the way it's supposed to be done. Isn't that interesting? Next slide. Okay, this is something else that the best hominoid tracks have. Dermal ridges. Now it's kind of hard to see, but dermal ridges are your fingerprints on your feet. Fingerprints on your feet. This is why they take a baby's footprint when it's born. Fingers too small to deal with, just stick its foot on. Same thing. Individual, unique. Point is that whoever is making, whoever's faking these things out around the world, thousands of them, is taking the trouble to make articulating feet that if they would just put on the market they could make a fortune in the prosthetics industry. And then they're taking the trouble to incise dermal ridges when lasers would have a hard time doing this. I mean criminals, if this was easy to do, criminals would get their fingerprints fixed, would they not? Instead of cutting them off, lasers really couldn't do this kind of work, I don't believe. Uh, okay. Okay. Thank you. No, I got it. I'm going to go with this one for now. Okay. So, you with me? It's a conspiracy to end all conspiracies, this making the hominoid track conspiracies. And what I'm trying to get you to see is that is in fact absurdity piled on absurdity that they're asking you to believe. And again, for the most part, you do believe that. Most people who came in here today probably believed everything that the tabloids have to say about the hominoids. Problem being, if the hominoids are real, what does it mean? We are off the flow chart of natural life on Earth, and they don't want that to happen. Neither science nor religion. So in this instance, they hold hands and walk down the path together. Okay, next slide. All right, check this again. Comparison, Bigfoot track, plaster cast, human foot, just to get this in shape in your mind again. Next slide. 
All right, another pair of hominoid tracks, as you can see. These are so grungy looking on the soles because they were taken out of clay as opposed to dirt, as you saw earlier. But in every other way, they're, they're hominoid tracks, are they not? We found, you know, they're found together, so we assume it's a male and a female like the two that we saw walking along at the Laetoli tracks, right? Would everybody agree? This is as hominoid as it gets, right? Wrong! Guess what these are? Neanderthals. These are Neanderthal tracks, absolutely and without doubt. Torriano, Italy, a cave 30,000 years ago. Neanderthal artifacts all over the place. Neanderthals. Bonafide. Now, what does this tell us? It tells us that the Neanderthals for sure are hominoids because they got hominoid feet stuck on them. Plus, they got hominoid heads stuck, as you saw from the skulls. Furthermore, we can assume, I think, fairly, that every one of the ones we saw earlier, all the way back to Lucy, four million years worth, had feet just like this and were, in fact, hominoids. The track you saw at Laetoli, remember the one down in the corner? It looked a heck of a lot like that, didn't it? The hominoids are the prehumans. That's the point I keep trying to make. Now, I'm extrapolating a little bit here. I'm taking a little risk because we don't have the feet nor the prints of any other prehuman. We just have to go with logic. But guess what we do have? We do have the feet of Neanderthals. Next slide. Here we go. Neanderthal foot, human foot, human foot, Neanderthal. Can everybody see this down at the bottom? I'm sorry, it's kind of low. Take a look so you can see. Stand up if you have to, be like a football game. All right, here's the deal. Notice there's no comparison. Look at the heel bone of the Neanderthal relative to our little nub of the heel bone. Look where our ankle base joint is as opposed to this huge, this is it, this is bone here. This is our little base joint compared to this giant base joint here and the squeeze forward of it. Notice, if you will, the great foreshortening of the forefoot and the widening of it relative to ours. Look at the skew. You can see the skew in the foot. See how squared up and solid that is like a rock. Look how much our big toe dominates our little four toes and how much these are much the same. This thing is built for balance, for solidity, for stability. We got a crummy foot, folks. Crummy foot and a crummy walk. We ought to complain to the boss about this. You can see why this thing walks so smoothly. It's just kabloom, boy. It's just perfect for maintaining balance and stability, carrying all that heavy bulk and weight. Good design, bad design. Next slide. OK, if I'm right, they're out there all these places. Where are they? All right, let's take a look at the world. Take away the deserts. Take away the tundra, and what you're left with is arable land, arable land, all right? This is where they live, in the black parts. The heavy, dense, deep forests and jungles of the world. This is where we live, the nice, cool, open areas, the pinks, the blues, and the purples, the primo niches, that's us, all right? Now, broken down, that is 55% for us, 45% for them, moving toward 40% for them. As you know, we're cutting down forests like crazy. It used to be 55% for them, 45% for us, 500 years ago, approximately. Okay, so you look at this and you say, well, wait a minute, we're sitting right here in the desert. We live, we, we live everywhere. No, we, we live in most of these environments, but we don't live, for the most part, up in these areas, in, in the Himalayas in here and in these jungles. If we live in the jungles, we live on the river. We don't live in the heart of darkness. When we have to live in the heart of darkness, what do we do? We cut it down. We'll cut roads through here, but we don't live in it where we've got to hack our way through every day to go to school or to the store. It just isn't going to happen. We're not physically designed for that. Our skin won't take it. If we, did, if we didn't have clothes and couldn't defeat the natural order of things. If you were to strip everybody in this room naked and put us out there to live like everybody else has to live, most of us would be dead in a few weeks from radiation poisoning. Those of us who have black skin would have a chance to make it to the equator, but couldn't stay and live in cold climates. We're not physically adapted to this planet. Understand that. Our skin does not let us go except in certain niches the primo niches. 
So understand, too, that we think we live in every one of the nooks and crannies out there. We are masters of all we survey. That's what we're told all the time. We're humans. We're masters of all we survey. We do not even survey all that we claim to be masters of. It will surprise you to know that of the United States alone, fully 25%, one-fourth, has never once been foot surveyed because it's just too hard to get in there and do the work. We survey from the air those areas. We do not go. We're not as tough as we think we are. Now, also understand that the hominoids are not just restricted to these areas. They move wherever there are forests. These are their, their real stomping grounds. But they go anywhere that there are forests. They use forests like highways because they are migratory animals. They migrate. They do not hibernate. They move with the seasons. And they use forests as their highways. They, in the, as they live in the forests, they do a split shift with the bears. Bears work the day shift, they work the night shift. It is, it's how it works. Also understand that of the 5,000 quality sightings that we have in the United States and Canada, now I'm not talking just you know skimpy ones, I'm talking good quality sightings, 5,000 in the last 50 years, half have been east of the Mississippi River. Every state has them except possibly Nevada, maybe the, no, just the mountains north. <laughs> we have them in Louisiana, down in the swamps, the little one. It's called Rougarou. When I was a little boy growing up, don't you get too far from the house, Rougarou will get you. The little red man of the woods, the booger man, boogie man. <laughs> Excuse me, booger man, right. <laughs> Slip of the tongue. Um, anyway, Florida has the skunk ape. Uh, New Jersey has the Jersey devils, Arkansas. Everywhere has them. I bet you every one of you have heard stories about this from your state. They're everywhere. And it's the same around the world. They share the planet with us. Okay, next slide. So, you say to me, well, okay, by George, we're humans. Why don't we just go out there and get one? Even so, we can do anything. Why don't we just mount up and go get one if there's so many of them out there? All right, Panda is a perfect example of what the problem is. The panda was last century's hominoids. Rumors would come out of China of this black and white bear that ate bamboo. And of course, every PhD in the world sitting behind his little desk does not even have to get his fanny up out of the chair to say, well, oh, forget that. They, we know they have black bears. We know they have brown bears. We know they have white bears. But they're all carnivores. No vegetarian bears. You kidding us? Ridiculous. And then in 1869, a French naturalist goes to Sichuan province, China, and sees the hide of a freshly killed one hanging on the wall, and he knows they're real. So every zoo and museum mounts up the expeditions that you would like to see mounted up today to go out to find the next panda and bring it in. Serious. Now, we're talking Sichuan province, uh, an area the size of the state of Arizona, very mountainous, hilly terrain, difficult terrain, covered with bamboo rather than woods, but in every other respect, like the environment that hominoids will be found in. How long do you think it took those teams, and this is back in the 1800s where people really knew their way around the woods, how long do you think it took? 60 years, and quit, quit giving away my punchlines. Don't do that anymore. 60 years, 60 years. Those of you who've seen the movie do not give away the punchlines. Okay, now it sounds like a gross exaggeration and it is. They only looked for about 30 years. This is where Ivy made the mistake. They only looked for about 30 years, and then they gave it up. And they said it has to be extinct now. And then 30 years later, Teddy Roosevelt's sons are out there doing some sport hunting, and they kill one. OK? So then they mounted up again, knowing that they, it's for real now. And because they had learned so much in the interim, they began to get them. And over the next 20 years, they brought in six. And we have the panda craze you know, that we have today. But even to this day, they're extremely difficult to go out into the wilds of Sichuan Province, China, and bring in a wild panda. Now, what is the panda doing that makes it so difficult to get one? Well, as you can see, it's very brightly colored and stands out very distinctively against its green background. <laughs> it lives during the day. It eats a very restricted diet, bamboo. It's very slow moving. You see them move in zoos. 
They're as stupid as a bag of hammers. They can't even reproduce in zoos. Can't even find each other and, or figure it out. I mean, <laughs> how, how stupid do you have to be? Anyway, the point is, they're not doing anything. They are living their lives, and the problem lies with us. We can't hack it in their world very easily. We think we're masters again of the world. We're not. We're not. And where they live is where the hominoids live. And the hominoids are bigger, faster, stronger, operate at night, eat anything in their world. They can hear better, see better, and I'm absolutely sure think better than we can. We're not going to just mount up and go get one because we've tried it many times and it hasn't worked. We're only going to see them by accident, encounter them by accident. And that's when it happens, and it happens a lot. We have good evidence on record of these encounters. Next slide. We're going to go over a few. The famous Patterson film, Roger Patterson took a film of a female hominoid walking along a creek, creek bank in 1967, October. You all saw this, well not all, but some of you saw this recently on a television program called World's Greatest Hoaxes. All right, that itself was a hoax. That program was a hoax. I, I wrote a long email about this, and it's on my site if you'd like to read it, www.lloydpie.com. It's a defense of the Patterson film showing what they did not talk about in that program, trying to make this film look like a hoax and pick on it, as people will do occasionally. There's no doubt that this is a bona fide film for a number of reasons we're going to go over. All right, first of all, it was a bright, sunny day, as you can see. What happened was the sun was shining such that it was glinting off of her shoulder and thigh as she walked, and you could see her muscles rippling in her shoulder, in her thigh, as she walks. In good slow-mo close-up, you can see that, which they did not provide in that, uh, in that program. All right, if that's a person in a suit, the suit has to be glued to naked skin. In the gluing process, you lose that flexibility, that ripple. The only thing that looks like this does in this film is real skin under, I mean real skin over real muscle working. So we could stop right here, it's real just based on that. Right there, but we don't have to stop. The arm, if you've all seen her walk, she walks along like this. She drags her arm down around her knees where everybody says, you know, the hominoids do. Why? The elbow articulates right here, which is much longer from shoulder to elbow than a human. If that's a human in a suit, impossible. You can't get an elbow bend at the same point. So we could stop right there. Solid proof that that's not a human being in a suit. But furthermore, Jerry Romney, the guy they said was in the suit, they stuck him with breasts. What would they do that for? Why go to the problem? Why go to the trouble? As she walks along and she turns back to face him, you see the breasts sway and she takes a couple of steps and you see that nice jiggle that we all know. <laughs> if it's a person in a suit in 1967, it's going to be those early silicone jobs. Remember those? <laughs> Absolutely real right there. Furthermore, she left tracks in the hard-packed sand of the creek bed. One inch deep, we have pictures, we have casts. That cast you saw earlier of the cast in the foot, that was her foot. No question, inch deep, walked a 200-pound man beside her not long after. He sank about a quarter of an inch. So we know that as she stood there doing this, she weighed 600 to 800 pounds. Fake that. That's got to be a real lead line suit, 600 to 800 pounds as she walks. So we know that it was a legitimate film. Furthermore, as they pointed out in the program, with the fake films, they can never tell you where it happened and who did it, who took it, because they don't want that guy to be grilled and they don't want experts to go and measure one limb here and know how long, how tall it really was. What Patterson did was he went right out fast as he could and begged every expert in the area that he could call, every anthropologist and zoo person, come out, bona fide sighting, please bring dogs. And you don't want to bring dogs because these things have a very powerful body odor that even, even tracking dogs will recoil from. If it's a person in a suit, it's like the suit's not even there, the dogs are after it. Patterson did, of course, no expert came. Needless to say, they never do. You can't get them to go because they know what will happen. 
A young man named Grover Krantz went out early in his career as an anthropologist, took a look at one, and he said, it looks real to me. And it's 30 some odd years later, and I think he's still trying for tenure. <laughs> They've made a tremendous example out of Grover Krantz for what happens to people who side with the enemy in this issue, which is a very volatile, very sensitive issue. Okay, so no experts would come, needless to say. Patterson did everything right that he could except film something that could be real. Other than that, he was great. Okay, next slide. Man named Albert Osman, picture taken 1957, talking about an event that occurred to him 33 years earlier in 1924 when he was a young man, a timber cruiser in the woods of southern British Columbia. He's taking some time off. He's out looking for gold mines, lost gold mines. He's sleeping in his sleeping bag one night, and suddenly Big Hand picks him up, shoves him to the bottom of the bag, slings him over its back like Santa's bag of toys, and scoops up his camp stores with the other hand, walks off with him. He is captured by a Bigfoot. Wow. He has marched for about an hour. He's got barely enough room at the top of the bag to breathe. The hand couldn't get quite around the bag, so he had enough room to breathe, but he stuck down the bottom of it. It dumps him out an hour later or so, and he's in a 10-acre basin of high, high rock walls where he can't get out, and there's one opening opposite where he is, and over there is the, the den of the, the living quarters of the male Bigfoot that got him, his mate, and their two offspring, a young male and a young female. And Albert Osman stays with them for six days before he can figure out a way to escape, which is very funny, very clever. Not going to go into it. Takes too long to tell. It's in the book, okay? But he gets away. The point of the story is not how funnily he escapes, but that he doesn't tell anybody for 33 years. Keeps it to himself, thinking everybody would think he was crazy, which they would do. And then in 1957, he reads an affidavit in a, in a paper by a man who saw one picking berries. And the man said, well, if anybody has an experience like this, would you share it with me? So Osman writes him a letter and says, that's what happened to me. Well, when people found out what happened to him, the roof fell in on the poor guy. Experts came in from all over the world. He had to take lie detector tests up the wazoo. You know how it works. And so you know that when you're telling a story, a long, detailed story, and it's a lie, you can't keep the details straight. You're going to goof it up, and they're going to figure it out. Sooner or later, you're telling a lie. He never goofed up. He passed all his lie detector tests. No, anybody that had anything to do with him, just read the testimonies, say he was absolutely A-plus, straight-up guy, telling a true story. Next slide. The famous Minnesota Iceman. Ice Child is more like it. This was a juvenile Bigfoot killed by a man named Frank Hansen in the woods of northern Minnesota. Ironically, in 1967, the same year that Patterson filmed his Bigfoot 2,000 miles away. All right, now, Frank Hansen shot it in the back, blew out that nice hole in its chest, dropped it, severed its spine, dropped it down. It pulled its arm up to protect its face from him, as you can imagine, shot it through the wrist, through the left eye, blew the right eye out onto its cheek, and blew out the back of its head. Coup de gras, killed it dead. At that moment, 1967, Frank Hansen could have changed history. He could have taken this thing, crammed it down the throats of science, and we would not be having this discussion today. We would all accept hominoids as a reality from that point forward. No problem. But Frank Hansen was not that kind of man. The kind of man he was, he saw the opportunity. He bought a seven-foot floor freezer. He threw the body in there, he filled it up with water, he froze it, he put a piece of plate glass over it, and he took it around to shopping malls and county fairs for about 12 years, from about 1978 to, I mean, excuse me, about 1968 to about 1980. Did anybody here besides me see it when it was out? There's always people that saw it, okay? So they can tell you that it was the real deal, okay? Now, what you saw if you went and paid your buck to see it was this thing laid out, and you could see it's kind of snowy, milky ice right here, but where you could see, you could see it was like glass. It was like air. It was clear. You know how ice can be. So you could see very clearly that this was an ex-living dead thing laying in front of you. But don't take my word for it. Take the word of a man named Ivan Sanderson. When Frank Hansen was trying to get publicity for this, he allowed Ivan Sanderson, a true zoologist and a great cryptozoologist, to study this thing for three full days. Very powerful lights, the whole works. And Sanderson wrote this tremendously detailed technical report about it, much of which I quote in the book. You read that, you will know the man knew what he was looking at from a technical zoology standpoint. 
I'm looking at it just with layman's eyes when I'm a young man, but they're perfect eyes, astronaut eyes. So I'll tell you what I saw. What you could see, what anybody could see, because the knees were almost to the top of the glass, is that every hair, it's, it, you know how hair floats in water? This is not our hair, this is primate hair, two to three inches long. It's sticking off, it's, it's like a pin cushion off its body. You can see right down to its skin wherever you look. And wherever you look, you're looking at what amounts to a small pencil lead, hair, round tucking into a pore, perfectly tightly round, wherever you look, millions of them, wherever you look. Now, what we're told is this was just a wax and rubber dummy made up by a, a charlatan who was out to just take advantage of people, right? Ask anybody who works in the rubber dummy, I mean wax museum business, and they'll tell you, the one thing you can't do well is hair, because to get the hair right, you've got to punch it in and you, with a tool, and you've got to pull that tool out, and it's going to leave a little nick mark around the hair. None of that in this creature. None. But the thing that really impressed me the most, and I'm sure everybody else will verify this, is you know when you kill a, a deer or something, you let it bleed out, but for a long time after it oozes that pink kind of fluid. You scrape your elbow for women who don't deer hunt. Scrape your elbow, you know, and after a while you're still oozing that pink sticky stuff. Well, that's, it was still doing that when he, when he froze it, when he put the water in. So as the water was freezing, that stuff was coming up in tendrils, ribbons, pink ribbons of that sticky, oozy stuff coming out of every wound, out of there, out of the mouth, out of the nose. You know when you have a traumatic head injury, you bleed out of your nose and your mouth as well, out of both eye sockets, out of the wrist. Bones were, little pieces of bone were sticking out of the wrist. Every one of those, and those ribbons went from down as deep in the holes as they could get up to the surface and they spread out in little pools, little circles at the top of the ice. Now, I defy anybody making a fake to even think to do that, much less pull it off and make it look so real. This was the real deal. Next slide. Perhaps the most interesting story of them all, Zana from Russia, an Alma. Remember I told you that the Almas were also man-sized, five to seven feet tall, 300, 600 pounds, and they're dominant in Russia and the Orient? This is Alma, the living Neanderthal. This is one of them right here. This is, Zana is an Alma, was an Alma. Now, understand this. In the Orient, the tradition when one of these things is captured for whatever reason, was to kill it immediately. Desiccate its body and sell its body parts for medicine, principally aphrodisiacs. That's the Oriental tradition. In the Russian area, though, when they would be captured, male or female, they would be used as slaves, physical slaves, held, spirits broken in these uh, primitive villages where they would be, and they would be used to carry wood, fetch water, uh, do the haying, all the heavy work nobody really wants to do. Make the slave do it. And so that became their fate. And for females, another aspect of it was they had to become the sex slaves of the men of the area. And that was one of the other great advantages to having a female. And so this is the fate that befell Zanna in about 1850. She was captured as an adult in 1850. We do not know how old she was. She was an adult. She was taken to the village of Tekina where they kept her in a hole for about three years until her spirit was broken enough to let her wander around. She was dependent on them for food and then they began to train her to fetch wood, fetch water, do the things that she had to do. And she became like the village pet for 40 years. She died in 1890. Now how do we know this? Because in the Orient and Russia, they don't have the same tradition that we have. They're very old countries. They've been living with this for a very long time, for centuries. They know they're real. They send research out, researchers out taking information about it. They send teams out trying to find them, or they used to when Russia had money. They don't now. But this was done in the mid-1970s. Excuse me, I'm sorry, mid-1960s. This research was done in the mid-60s. So in the mid-1960s, this is an area of Kazakhstan where she lived, where people lived very long lives. You know those p places in the world where people live up around 120 years old? So they had over 100 people above the age of 80 that had known her quite well in their youth. There were 10 still alive who had attended her funeral. So they were able to get tremendous corroborative evidence, corroborative testimony about her, her lifestyle, and everything about her from all these different people so we have an amazing view of what she was like and what her life was like. Uh, again, a lot of which I go over in, in the book. But the main thing is that she never learned to speak, but she learned the language. They could talk to her and she'd know what they meant. And while there, 
She gave birth eight times to hybrids with men of the village. Eight times. Killed the first four accidentally because her kind apparently washes the newborn off immediately. She would take it to the freezing glacial river that ran through the village and because they had so much human in them, it would kill them. So the last four, the village women took them from her at birth and raised them on their own because he looked so human and every pair of hands was very valuable in one of those primitive villages like that and so they raised them up and they became Russian citizens. Married, had children, her great-grandchildren are alive in Russia to this day. I know it's an amazing story. Now what do people say about her children? Well, the, everybody said that they were indeed taller than most, bigger than most, ro a little more robust than most, but not giants, not superhumans, just strong, you know, big and strong people. Darker skinned than most, but not, not truly negroid. Hair like, you know, everybody, but not covered in hair like she was. Average intelligence, not, not wizards, not stupid. Ugly enough to make a freight train take a dirt road. <laughs> Unfortunately for them. But they could speak, that's the key, they could all speak. They had very high-pitched voices, but they could speak, which allowed them to integrate into the community as humans, even though they were clearly not quite humans. So the researchers were real excited to get all this information. It's like, wow. And, th and they knew where she was buried. She was buried in the village cemetery. Unfortunately, this is a Muslim area. They don't mark gravestones there. So they knew she was in the village cemetery, which had existed for centuries, and, and they couldn't say just where because of the 10 people that were alive, they all had different memories of where it had been. Who knew that 70, 80 years later, somebody was going to care? So they couldn't decide. They couldn't, and they would have had to bulldoze the whole thing. The village wouldn't let them do that. So somebody says, well, guess what? Her youngest son, Kvit, died in 1954, only 10 years prior to this study. So they said, we know where he is. We'll let you dig him up. So boy, they dug him up. Her youngest son, Kvit. Now, before we look at his skull, I want to say again, remember, Neanderthals had bigger brains than we did, and they carry them, we do rather, than they carry them in a bun in the back of their head called the occipital bun. All right, let's take a look at Kvit's, Kvit's skull. Here you go, right here. Notice, if you will, that's a remnant of an occipital, occipital bun right there. Notice how much of a forehead he doesn't have. <laughs> look at the size of these brow ridges. Look at that eye socket. Is it starting to look familiar? Look at the size of that nasal passage. Look at the size of these teeth. Look at the size of that jawbone. Look at the size of the cheekbone. But look at that chin. Allows him to speak. This is an ugly dude, kids. <laughs> this is a Neanderthal, basically. This is a guy you do not want to meet in a dark alley. Now what, of course, anthropologists say is that he is an extreme variation on the human norm. An extreme, <laughs> real extreme variation on the human norm. But that's how they explain it. Okay, I ask you to take my word for it. Hominoids are real. They live with us today. They have always lived with us. It is their planet. They are the native, indigenous, upright walking primate of planet Earth. There was a split somewhere between the down on all four primates and the up on two feet primates, but we're not the one. The prehumans are the prehominoids. Go with me on that. Now, if you do, what it means is, as I said earlier, we human beings do not have a place in the natural scheme of life on Earth. And that's a problem. So if we don't, where did we come from? Why and how did we start leaving fossils on the planet at only 120,000 years ago? All right? Unlike Alan, the speaker you saw earlier, and perhaps unlike some of the others you might hear later, I, I have my own opinion. I don't necessarily agree with him. You're here to evaluate what we say and decide on what you believe. I am a Sitchin, a pro Sitchin person, as you will see. Okay? I have studied, and in part four of my book, I base part four on the writings of Zechariah Sitchin and the ancient Sumerians, because next slide, I believe that the answer to where we came from is in fact going to be found in Sumer, ancient Sumer, modern day Iraq, Tigris Euphrates River, Zagros Mountains, the Fertile Crescent.
permission, I have the honor of presenting to you one of the most remarkable men in the world. How remarkable. He's swift. Hello, my name is Fritz Kao, and welcome to my YouTube channel, Fritz Kao Vids. Hello, my name is Fritz Kao, and welcome to my YouTube channel, Fritz Kao Vids. These are books that cannot be purchased at a bookstore, they cannot be checked out at a library. And when you look through these books, they go on and on like this, to where there's a lot of stuff in code. Go ahead and, and check this out. This gives you a full diagram of the altar in which they conduct ceremonies. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! The Winchester 22 long rifle subsonic. You can feel the power in that shell. Fuck yeah. <laughs> Very nice. I'm going to be going on a uh, traveling trip from Maple Rapids, Michigan to Grand Rapids, Michigan on the Grand River by canoe. What a wonderful day it is today. Four hours into the trip. <laughs> hey, offering a trip on a boat? Who's going to pass up on that? Oh. The Romans ever did for us. All right, so here we are approaching. Oh, panel on the other side. I'm taking a pee. I got you. And that, we're having a groovy time. Still gonna need more leaves. Hi, my name is Fritz, as always, and welcome back to my YouTube channel, as always. And here's Turtle Island. Welcome to my YouTube channel, Fritz Kao Bids. And other different types of videos are not necessarily quite like this. Very similar types of The last time I saw Madison was Friday night. She had left the house to go on her camping trip. Um, when we got to the campsite, the only things that we found was Maddie's tent and her truck. One of our investigative priorities upon arriving in Bannon was to identify and interview everyone that was at the party that night with Maddie. I think it's no secret that in the course of the investigation polygraph has been used as an investigative tool. We have received cooperation from everyone that was at that party that night to eliminate themselves from the, any involvement in Maddie's disappearance. We live at 24 seven, that she is missing. And it's our child, it's, a, you know, she's, to some people she may just be, you know, a girl that's missing to us. Like she's our world, she's our daughter and we need to find her. We need to get her home where she belongs. This is just, it's, it never lets up. Never. You're reminded of it constantly.